All right. Uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome up here uh, Cindy Pavla, who is a special assistant to the president of Northern Michigan University. She has a presentation to make to our keynote speaker. Thank you, Dan, and welcome everyone to this year's Sonderegger Symposium. We always enjoy this event, and uh, welcome on behalf of President Schuling. So we would like to call up our keynote speaker, Ed McBroom, Senator Ed McBroom. Are you nervous? You look a little nervous. I haven't done anything to hurt anyone in a long time. Um, some of you uh, may not be aware that Senator McBroom was just recently recognized as a 2021 Michigan Michiganian of the year by the Detroit Free Press. As Oh, did the Detroit News. Okay, I'm following a script. <laughs> I know I read the story. I, I even printed it out, so I had a, a copy. Um, as an alum, of course, Senator McBroom um, has been a long time and a great advocate for Northern, and we certainly appreciate that. But today we wanted to recognize him and congratulate you on being named the Michiganian of the Year by somebody. <laughs> <laughs> And we also um, know that you couldn't accomplish all that you do without all the support you get from the folks at your, in your home. And so as a special treat, we, uh, for everybody back at the farm, we wanted to make this um, small little gift of Michiganian cookies, Michigan cookies, for the, for the family and for you, and to say congratulations. And if you could stay here. We're going to get a picture with Dan, me, and you. Okay. Because Michigan turns the right way up. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Okay. Just all hold it if you want to. Hey, you want me to go? Go ahead. Okay. Just go for it. <laughs> you don't have to make a little bit. I'll put my phone up here so I have a timer so I don't bore you too long. Uh, the, uh, it's, uh, it's really an honor to be with you today, and uh, thank you so much to Northern for the kind words and for the gift. My kids will be overjoyed because they're just wrapping up eating all of the Halloween candy they got the other day. <laughs> and uh, they, they, love, they love sweets. They take after their dad in that respect, for sure. Uh, it's been always my honor to be able to go about this state in, in this role and in a few of the other roles I had before I, I ended up in the legislature and tell people that I'm a graduate of Northern. Uh, it's a, a place that, you know, I didn't expect to be a Northern alum when I got, when I was finishing up high school, my plans were to go to MSU and to study cows and know more about cows and farming. It's something that my dad had always suggested because um, he didn't get a degree in agriculture at all and ended up farming. And he was like, you know, it'd be great if somebody knew more about this. And uh, then I, my older brother was there and I thought, well, I'll still go to MSU, learn about cows and also get my degree in teaching so I can, because uh, it's crowded on the farm for too many people, right? For a little farm. And I ended up, I'm a procrastinator, so <laughs> ended up uh, applying to MSU a little bit late and being put on the waiting list. And I was dating a girl who was coming to Northern, and I was in the choir program that they had for high school choirs. And so I had a little familiarity. I, I loved high school bowl and my time spent over at the LRC. So I thought, oh, I'll go to Northern for a semester and then transfer to MSU. And uh, lo and behold, showed up, got sucked into the marching band, which is basically a cult. They, you know, give you funny clothes, take all your money, and bring you into a group that you never call home again. And um, couldn't, I loved it. I couldn't wait to, for every game, couldn't wait each year to come back up for band camp. In fact, later today, I'm st I've worked my schedule out in such a way that I can go down to the marching band rehearsal today and watch the band rehearse. And so I ended up staying at Northern and getting a degree in music education instead, and it has held a, a really great spot in my heart ever since. Um, it's a remarkable institution for us to have in the UP. And so 
it's, it's a true honor to receive recognition like that. I appreciate it. The facts of the matter are the challenges that Northern faces in communicating what it can do for the state and what it can do for the students up here as an institution, what it does for our communities, uh, parallel very much so the challenges that your state legislators face in serving the people of the UP. It is a constant challenge for the Upper Peninsula to be heard, and it always has been. Uh, dating back to the beginnings of our state, when suddenly we were made a part of Michigan, unexpectedly to many who were here, there weren't many here, but for those who were here, many of them were very upset about being added into the state after the Toledo War settlement. Mm -hmm. And as they began attending legislative sessions, one of the most notable uh, representatives at the time actually brought his dog sled team to the state capitol and drove it up on the lawn to prove the point that they should let the UP go. <laughs> they should let them go, let them free. And over the years, there have been many such movements because the people of the UP recognized Lansing's a long way away. Back then, there was no roads. They had to leave in September or October to get to a Lansing session because otherwise the weather would keep them from getting there in January. And those challenges have persisted, although driving cars a little bit easier than a dog sled. It remains very difficult for us to convey the spirit of the place, the true spirit of it. And a lot of people downstate think they know how to take youpers. <laughs> But to really get that true spirit of the place, the heart of the people, the needs of the people is, remains very challenging. Communication is one of the keys to that. And that's where Northern, um, the many organizations that you're a part of, Michigan Tech, our um, economic development groups, our local units of government, all play a role in attempting to come together and provide an amplification for the voice of the people in the Upper Peninsula. You have four legislators representing you from the UP. At present, you could have a maximum of six, but with uh, population loss and the restructuring of the districts, the chances of ever getting to six have never been less. Mm -hmm. We are going to continue to have a smaller and smaller voice unless we see a dramatic turnaround in population um, for the Upper Peninsula. And so, what are some of the focuses then of your legislators, of myself as, as the senator, um, soon, right now for 12 UP counties and soon to be for all 15 counties of the UP, if I'm blessed with the opportunity to continue to serve you for another four years. How do we amplify our voice and our needs so that we see the growth, so that we don't lose more ground? I would tell you that coming together and recognizing the strength that comes from coming together has never been more critical on so many issues. One of the main ones I've been working on recently involves mental health. Mental health is still structured in this state around provisions of law that date back to the 1920s, very county-based, very much at a time when each county charted its own path. How do we continue to do that at present? It's not possible. There, are, there isn't the critical masses needed to obtain the services at each county level that we truly need. We need to start thinking differently about mental health in the Upper Peninsula and think about it as one community of 300,000 people. Because any city in this state with 300,000 people has far more services available to them for mental health than the Upper Peninsula does. But yet the UP is not with a, doesn't have a central executive, doesn't have a central administration. Instead, you've got me, <laughs> one senator. And I have a lot of things, you know, put on my plate every day from various individuals who want um, help with getting their unemployment benefits, help with the trouble they're having with ORVs on the trail behind their house, help with, um, getting their driver's license renewed after it's been suspended for something 20 years ago. Uh, you know, there's just all these little things. So how do we come together? And these are, the, you know, the various challenges that your legislators are facing 
on, on a regular basis. And yet now, in the current political environment, there's so many more challenges because mm -hmm. communication is truly breaking down between people. It's breaking down to the extent that someone will not believe what you are telling them if they also associate you with a particular group or another particular issue. And as soon as they find out, oh, you talked with this person, then everything else you say is no longer believable. I think that this stands as a fundamental problem for all of our society moving forward. How do we move forward if we can't talk to our neighbors because of what sign they put in their yard last election season? How do we move forward if we find out they like a certain kind of music that we don't like, right? It's that, it boils down to something that ridiculous. I, don't, I won't talk with you because you eat foods I don't like. Now it sounds really silly because we're like, well, I know my neighbor and just because he likes the wrong kind of music, I still know him. But we're ex while we're giving that grace to our next door neighbor, we as a society are giving less and less grace to the people who live a little bit further away and aren't our next door neighbor. And we have to find a way to change that mindset. We have to start giving each other a little bit of grace again, a little bit of grace to understand that, hey, 20 years ago I might have had some views that I don't have anymore. A little bit of grace to say, my neighbor voted for somebody that I don't think was a good idea and I think did a lot of bad things, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily were a bad person or they supported all those things or that their candidate even wanted those outcomes. We have to start giving our neighbors that grace and interestingly, we give ourselves that grace, right? And this is what Jesus means when he says, you know, love thy neighbor as you love yourself. So we give each other, we give ourselves grace to change our minds and to come with a different opinion. But do we give our neighbor that grace? And I mean, I get very frustrated even amongst um, those who are of the same um, religious background as I am as an evangelical Christian who will give somebody in the grocery store line who cuts in front of them a lot of grace, but not give somebody who has a political dispute with them a lot of grace. As if Jesus somehow said, grace to these people, no grace to these people because they're politically opposing you and they might be destroying your entire worldview. It's like, they still get grace. We still have to love them. And this is, I think, not just a challenge, you know, for me as an Upper Peninsula legislator, it's a challenge right now for our entire country. But my influence, my sphere of influence, is the Upper Peninsula. I take the Upper Peninsula's cause to Lansing, to the best of my ability. And I see all across the communities I represent and the people I work with and around our nation, a failure to comprehend the size of the actual sphere of influence each of us has. People have instead decided, I need to fix that problem over there. I need to race to the farthest places and fix it from the top down. If I could just make Washington see it my way, that'll fix everything. If I could just make Lansing see it my way, that'll fix everything. And people get mad at me, <laughs> because I don't see it their way, or because I, don't, I am trying hard not to approach the problem that way. Because I believe, fundamentally, the problem is not addressed from the top down, but from the bottom up in what we teach our children, which is, if you want a better world, if you want people to treat you the right way, then change the way you treat people. Change the way you live in your daily life. If you want the world to be a better place, be a better person. Figure out how that is. For me, that's following the tenets of Christianity. That's following the teachings of Jesus Christ that's reading my Bible. Not all of you would agree with that, and that's fine. How, how are you structuring your worldview 
to understand how to be a better person. Grab onto that. Grab onto how to be a better neighbor. Grab onto how to love your neighbor as yourself. How, and, and from that, I think we can see a renewal of community, a renewal of the idea of community, which is dying on the vine, one tweet at a time. Community is who's, who, you can, who you can touch, whose life you can be involved in, whose life you can make a difference in, who needs your help that you can help. And we're losing that because social media is a big part of that, but we live in a world that's teaching all this materialism and you get it for yourself. Get it for yourself. And we need to revitalize the idea of community. And I want to tie this back in then with, you know, as a legislator, I'm trying my best, which some of you might think <laughs> isn't very good, and I can accept that, but how do, how do we look out there, how do I look out there and say, how can I help the communities I represent? What can I do at the state level for them? One of the big things that I was so convinced of when I first started into the legislature is that we were changing the way we educated children in such a way that they couldn't stay here in our communities with the jobs and opportunities that we had available. That we weren't getting the opportunity to teach them for the jobs and the heritage that we have. Natural resource industries, service-based industries, manufacturing, so many great opportunities. Truck drivers are getting old. We're running out of truck drivers. Timber jobs, foresters, these are wonderful opportunities that have made the UP a place that we, many of us love. And so I wanted to help my community by getting to Lansing and changing the way Lansing was directing education. Personally, I feel like Lansing shouldn't direct education that much at all. It should be really driven almost exclusively at the local level with some oversight from Lansing. But I got there a little late for that discussion. So how do I fit into the current discussion? And so when I challenge myself to represent all of you, to represent the Upper Peninsula, I look out there and see what, are, what has made the community of the UP, which is truly, in, in my opinion, one of the strongest remaining communities that you can find. How do we strengthen that? What, what has made that a place? Why do we consider this someplace special? Many individual reasons, but when it all boils down to is this is our community. This is our amalgamated opinions and thoughts and ideas of what it looks like come together to create this UP culture that we love so much. And I and the rest of the legislative team march on down to Lansing for you every week and try to stand up and talk about that and try to represent that, whether it's in asking for funding for the university or asking for funding for a road or asking for a new policy regarding hunting or fishing or mining. There's, there's just so many things and each one of you I'm sure could identify one particular thing that interests you very much, but we're trying to bring that down there. And the more you're involved with each of your communities with your local governments, with your organizations, your schools, the more we know what it is that you want us to do. And so COVID, of course, has made this really challenging for all of us. Um, Zoom meetings are not my favorite thing to do, uh, but we have, we have to get past those challenges because the most important one is somehow for us as legislators to make that connection with all the different small communities that are within the whole of the Upper Peninsula. And so my guidance was to talk about the challenges that I face as a legislator. I, um, I hope that I've touched on some of that and, and given you some you know, passion, again, for community. You know, when I look at community, there's so many, your, there's your civic organizations that are struggling to get membership. There's your high school sports teams that are struggling to have students participate. 
There's fairs, community events, concerts. There's city bands and, and county bands. These are some of just the traditional examples of things that we do for community. I direct the Norway city band. And every year I go out there and try to recruit a bunch of high school students to come in and play with you know, about the, the 20 regulars from the, from the area that play. And I always try to tell these kids, this is your opportunity to serve your community. Yeah, you're gonna get some money, you're gonna learn something about music, you're gonna keep your chops in shape for, for next year's marching band, but you're also gonna be part of this community. And you're gonna see people who come out every week not just to support us, but because we're there to provide something to them and interacting, our lives woven together, knit together here, sharing common experiences, bringing old and young together, not just like social media communities, which are homogenous for the most part, right? You have this community of people who like this thing. You have this community who likes another one. I'm on several of those. I'm on a group of farmers who like upright silos. Okay, sounds crazy to most of you probably, but there's a lot of farmers who hate upright silos. I don't want anything to do with those guys because I don't agree with them. So I hang out with the guys who believe in upright silos and we, you know, trash talk the other guys. Not really, just, but, you know, and then I'm with a group of people, you know, 250 cow dairy farms and smaller, you know, and with another group of marching band aficionados, okay. Those are great and fun, and, and they're, they're great to be with, but I don't know a lot of those people. I don't have the opportunity to impact their lives very much, and they just agree with me all the time. When we're part of our local community organizations, Rotary, Kiwanis, bands, municipal government, charities like Habitat for Humanity and others, we're associating with people who have common interests, but also come to us and we interact with who disagree with us on other things who don't always agree with us, and we get to spend time together, learn from each other. <laughs> How do you think it is that the world right now has never seen more flat earth, literal flat earth supporters than ever before, right? <laughs> because, and this is just Ed McBroom's kind of analysis of this, but you, you used to, every community, every city had kind of its, you know, town fool, right? You know, the guy is kind of out there, but he was our guy. We loved him, everybody kind of understood that. And he thought, everybody thinks I'm crazy, but at least, you know, they give me a place and they hear me out. He believes in flat earth, you know, okay. But now he can go online and find 10,000 other people who believe in flat earth, so suddenly he's like, well, I, I always knew the rest of the people I was around were the idiots, and I'm the smart guy. <laughs> I mean, it's totally flipped the dynamics because of, because of that. And what can we do, what can I do as your legislator, what can the UP legislative team do to drive us back to getting to know each other, to knowing our neighbor, to interacting with each other, to strengthening the family, and the community, the churches, the local governments right here where we're at. And that's going to continue to be kind of my focal point as I move forward with legislation. Whether you, you agree or disagree with the nuance of every individual piece of legislation, you're never going to have a legislator who agrees with everything you do. I, everything, you know, it's just not going to happen. And I got a lot of people right now who are like, everybody wants a blank. Right now I'll say, you know, everybody wants a full forensic audit, Ed. And I'm like, well, that's actually not true because I hear from a lot of people who don't. And they're like, well, you have to do it because I'm your, I'm your constituent. You told me to. It's like government wouldn't, it would never work if that was the way it went, right? Because if I have to do what every one single person says, that would be, 280,000 exactly different things to do. <laughs> Government would never work then. But I have to reach out and hear what people are saying and respond to them. And, and I want to be able to do that to the best of my ability. And I hope that as you watch the work that I do, that my colleagues do from the UP, that you know that our guiding star continues to be how do we strengthen this community. And to do that, we need to hear from you. We need to be part of your life and your community too. So with that, I'll, I'll end. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to take questions or not, but I'd be happy to take a few questions if there's time for that.
Uh, there, there it is. There it is. So, does anyone have a question for uh, the senator? I have a hard time believing nobody here has a question for for our senator. Ed, John Daly here. Who was your favorite teacher in uh, at Norway Vulcan? At Norway Vulcan? Wow. I had a lot of good teachers at there. <laughs> Hi, Mrs. Daly. <laughs> the, uh, Mrs. Daly was my seventh, no, eighth grade English teacher. Uh, yeah, a long time ago. I always remember when my first campaign in 2010, um, I got invited to the retired school personnel's uh, luncheon for a Q&A or a forum with my opponent. And I walked in there and um, Miriam Linder, Ms. Linder, that I'd had in second grade was there. And kind of the remarkable thing in my mind about that was how the first election I ever stood for was in, sec it was in her homeroom class to be class president, and I lost. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was vice president, because I came in second to Katie Galino, and Katie Galino was only absent one day the entire year, because Ms. Linder had things for the president to do. And every day the president had to do stuff, and I only got to ever fill in once the whole year. Any other questions? You is have a question? A, okay, is that Dr. Sari I see back there? That is Dr. Sari. Dr. Dr. Sari was one of my great professors that I had um, during, I think it was my freshman year, it might have been my second year at Northern. We had a history of the third world together. And, I still have a number of the books and, and think fondly on those classes. So thank you, Dr. Sari, for what you gave to me as my professor. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, at the risk of taking it a different direction, uh, I appreciate the higher philosophical stance sure. from which you talk. Um, but the thing that bothers me, and I agree with you that we need to come together, but as you said, the silos, mm -hmm. somebody likes this and somebody doesn't. Yeah. The thing that I'm most concerned about is the authoritarian leanings of people uh, in legislatures and in Congress and the types of legislation that they're passing, regardless of whether people want it or not, just because they have the majority. And that's the thing that, that really concerns me about this country and Michigan and, and other states, of course. Some states are much worse than Michigan right now. Yeah. How do you reconcile that when you're on the floor of the legislature and you're, you're trying to work out issues like that? And also, I appreciate the courage for you standing up for the, the audit of the election. I really think you did a great job on that. Absolutely. And so I'll leave it kind of at that and let you take on. Sure. No, it, again, I guess I'd start with addressing that just from kind of my higher philosophical view, because I like I like living up there and looking at the way things ought to be and the way things were envisioned by our founders and, and by other reformers over the years. We, um, we see our nation, and to my way of thinking and to my analysis of it historically, trending more and more in both sides clearly uh, to a frustration that then feels like the solution is one party rule. Feels like the solution is um, letting my side have all the levers because it's too messy otherwise. People are frustrated with the give and take and they're frustrated that well it takes too long and we got to do it right now and if we don't you know it's bad things are going to happen and it'll be all over and you know I I have, I'm, I'm convinced that our system of government instead relies a lot more on people being, I don't, I don't think resigned is the right word for it, but content with the fact that you can't always have it your way and that the majority rules is and the consent of the governed are the principles that we have to stick with, but we also have to protect the minorities' rights and opinions. And what I see happening, particularly in Michigan's legislature, is the erosion of the minorities' rights and, 
and and I think, to, to my analysis, a significant portion of that is occurring due to term limits and, and selfishness, I mean, both. But ter before term limits, there was a institutional respect and knowledge for the process. And remember that the process is always there, the slow, slow, painful toil of change, of legislation, protects us from dramatic swings and of one side usurping tyrannical power. And with term limits coming in in Michigan, we're the most aggressive term limits in the country. Um, there has been a real erosion of that institutional knowledge of how things go. What you see happen on the floor, especially in the House, where I served six years, is oftentimes for, for ordained drama, preordained, yeah, preordained drama, you know, and where it's like, okay, you're gonna speak, you want five people to speak, you can have five people speak. There's no randomness, there's nobody jumping up and saying, hold on a second, I have a thought I wanna share. There's, there's no real belief from most of the members that my thoughts should affect your thoughts and potentially convince you that m my viewpoint needs to be considered. We're quashing that in Michigan. I can't speak for everywhere else, but I see that here. It's a symptom of a larger problem, but it is clearly something that the system was created to protect, and we are dismantling that system um, through attrition primarily in Michigan. So how do we reset that? I don't rightly know, except to what I said to before, trying to be better myself. Because I've certainly, within that time period that I have served, had moments where I fell into those same traps. I certainly walked into the job with some of that same mindset and have tried to change my mindset to that and recognize that uh, the minority's rights and opinions matter and have to be protected because they could be in the majority another time. People's opinions might change. And so I've introduced numerous pieces of legislation to reform because as I've studied American history, you'll see these kind of ebbs and flows of exactly what we're experiencing now to some extent. And reforms come up, whether it's the recall, the initiative, the petition, um, all of those, you know, um, the direct election of senators, things like that, that we didn't have, that after a while the system begins to kind of break down because people find out how to abuse it, how to get around it, how to tyrannize it. And so reformers have to come up and say, we need to reform, not burn down, reform to continue to protect the process. It's, it's very similar to any other laws that we write in society, right? We pass a law against something and it works great for a while, but then we start to see around the edges, people toying with it and getting away with things. And okay, now we need to change the law again. So. That's, that's my approach as a legislator to it, as a human being. We need to restore community and, and compassion for one another, love for one another, grace for one another. And that's the job of each of us individually, the job of our churches and others to change the hearts of the people. Because otherwise we're just plunging, we're just slowing down the, the chaos. I don't know that that helps a lot, or, <laughs> but that's the best answer I have. All right, we have someone back here as a question. Um, Ernie Johnson, not really a question, but listening to your term limits and that, I was involved with the legislators prior to a term limits, and I saw what was going on there. I worked with a lot of them. Yeah. And even now, after term limits, so I can see the point where the erosion of people getting in there because they're short term, they're only going to do what they want for that period of time, and they're gone. And I could, back in early times where the knowledge was there, they were working on it, you could work with them, and they understood. Nowadays, the difficulty now is getting your point across to them because they're short term. A couple of years, four years, two terms, that's it, and they're gone, and they, they could really not interested in a lot of that stuff. And yeah. that. So, so a lot of this, what you're saying is, 
is true, and the effect that the downstate legislators versus the upstate, uh, the UP legislators, the effect they have down there to the point where they're more concerned what's happening downstate than up here in that. And I've been seeing that. And uh, I'm a local representative, so uh, I have a good feel there. In that. But that's my feeling is that term limits, when they started, sounded great, but they've eroded to the point where the Upper Peninsula really is left out, as far as I'm concerned, at this point in time. And, and I would add, I'm not necessarily saying we should have no term limits or age limits that, like we have for judges. I think there's a validity. It's just that we have really, really short ones. And we're going to the barrel so often in the Michigan House <laughs> that we draw more and more short, you know, short straws. <laughs> Some of you might think I was one of the short straws, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you. I had to learn a lot when I first got elected. But you go to the barrel that much more often that we're replacing people. We replace up to two-thirds of the House every two years mandatorily, not just because everybody's angry, but because you have to. And that just leads to a lot of chaos. And we could do better. I've suggested reforms to term limits on several occasions. I've introduced it. Um, I believe that that conversation continues to ripen and may eventually come to fruition. Many states in the 90s adopted the exact same term limits we have now. We're the last state to not reform that since then. So um, I think that it's an important discussion point, and I like to plant the seeds of discussion on that issue. Anything else I could tell you? I, I don't know what your schedule is. I don't want to hold you up too long, Dan. Oh, we've got another 10 minutes or so before we have to start switching over. I do have a microphone, though, and I'm like, <laughs> wow, I finally get to ask a question of a state senator. Um, I'm a historian, a museum director. Uh, it's something that's very important to me. I've worked in museum systems around the United States and have seen have a lot of friends who work in other museum systems. And I, honestly, one of the things that's most disappointing to me in the state of Michigan is just how much we have downgraded the funding of our history yeah. museums, um, and staffing at the museums, um, and, and expansion. We just, compared to Wisconsin or Minnesota, which also are state-funded historical societies, our, our Michigan History Center and the library have really seen a lot of cuts in the last 20 years. And you as a historian, as a, as a lover of history, what is your take on that? How do you see that we can expand that? Yeah, thank you for that. It's, it's an issue I've, not a lot of people know that I've been working on kind of quietly in Lansing. I, I love to go over to the State um, History Museum, the archives, um, meet with the folks who are restoring our Civil War flags, and, and there's so much history you know, inside the Capitol and around the Capitol. And one of the things that has stood out to me as I've met with museums across the UP on various times and down in Lansing is that in the early 70s, the federal government put a significant pot of money to go out and survey the countryside for historical things and to take that inventory of what things are around Michigan that are of historical significance. and. That was 50 years ago. And things that they didn't think were significant 50 years ago when they did that survey are suddenly now a lot more historically significant. We need to do a, a new survey of those items and, and of our countryside and see what's out there that we're, we're failing to recognize. Um, that's something I've been working on, trying to see if there's funding and, and a willingness to do that. Um, one of, there's a, a UP lady who's been serving in the Michigan House and Senate some too since the 80s, not as a legislator, but as a staff member either in the clerk's office or in individual members' offices. She's from um, both the Iron Mountain and the um, uh, Lake Linden area. And she's been collecting historical documents, books, art, and other things of the legislature. and. She has this beautiful collection of things she's built up to a point now where when members go to throw it away, the sergeants and janitors find it and save it and bring it to her. Um, John Kivala found a whole set of journals that he brought to her. Um, her, um, her name is Joy. And so she's about to retire. And she's really concerned about what's going to happen to everything she's put together. And so I'm working with her and a number of others to 
pass a statute that would protect, would set aside a room for her collection and other people's collections. Because um, if there's no statute protecting it, then it's just at the whim of whatever person is in leadership at the time. Um, and one of the proudest things I ever got to do with John Kivala was in setting up the Heritage Hall um, project at the Capitol that's built. John and I envisioned something a lot grander. Um, we weren't able to get that plan done. I spent, a, I spent a Thursday morning crawling around under the floors in the Capitol with John, you know, to, so he and I could advocate to our colleagues the importance of investing in the building and, and in this History Center Heritage Hall. And that's, I just had a tour of that this week. So I continue to try and do what I can to support those things. Um, I certainly recognize there's more to be done. It's one of many balls that I try to juggle on a, on a daily basis. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have any uh, further questions? Well, if not, Senator McBroom, thank you so much for coming and being here today and speaking Thanks. on everyone. Thank you all. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks, Cindy and Mindy, for bringing those. Um, we will be starting again at 2 p.m. We have two sessions, one going on in here on Native American intergenerational trauma. And then in Peninsula 2, we have a session on uh, the Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore and tourism in the Upper Peninsula. So uh, we'll start up in about 10 minutes or so.